Hello, I'm Jeremy Werner. I'm the Corporate Vice President of the Storage Business Unit at Micron Technology. And I'm very happy to be joined by two industry heavyweights. First, Mike So, who's the founder and CEO of Cloudian. And secondly, Kumaran Siva, who's the Corporate Vice President of Strategic Business Development at AMD. Good to be here. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Great to have you guys. So we're here today to talk about uh, Cloudian's Hyperstore solution and Object Storage. The three companies, AMD, Micron, and Cloudian, have been working together to bring to market uh, new and more advanced object storage solutions. So, Mike, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what is Hyperstore. Yeah, so Hyperstore is XFI scale, um, fully S3 compatible um, object storage that um, customers deploy in their own data centers and primarily to solve the problems of data sovereignty, performance, and security. For years, we've been hearing about um, really focus on three different types of storage in the data center. So block, file, and object storage. And kind of the traditional view of object storage has been, its primary use has been for archival or uh, backup storage. So in other words, maybe not the highest performing workloads. That seems to be changing with some of the new uh, workloads like artificial intelligence, machine learning, real-time analytics. What are you seeing in terms of changes in the object storage landscape? Yeah, exactly. Um, what we have seen is that um, there's the definite shift. And one thing that everybody misses about object storage is that it's fundamentally the most scalable and um, the most powerful set of APIs and technologies to deal with massive amounts of data. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's why in the public cloud, over 90% of all data is stored in the object storage format using object storage protocols. And S3 has become the new language that you use to access and, and manipulate data at scale. Uh, so when you look at the new kinds of use cases that people are talking about in terms of data lake housing or AI and so forth, you're dealing with data that's at that scale, at exabyte scale. And that's so naturally in object storage is evolving into serving those kind of applications as the primary storage rather than the, the secondary or the sort of archival storage. Wow. And we, we're definitely seeing a lot of that. I mean, a few few years ago, I wouldn't say like mo most customers are talking to us only about spinning drives. Now, probably more than half the customers, even those that are buying spinning drives, are talking to us about, hey, you know, a time will come that our uh, data is going to be on sort of state. Yeah, that sounds that's good. Wonderful. To, yeah. That yeah. sounds good to me. Music for your ears. <laughs> uh, yeah. Kumran, you have recently released your fourth generation of Epic processor, yes. and you've been supporting and innovating in the object storage domain for quite some time. Can you talk a little bit yeah, about absolutely. what AMD does so in that space? So AMD is now, you know, our fourth, you mentioned our fourth generation processor. This is our fourth generation in five years, and we released it back in November, actually. And uh, it's gone really well in terms of adoption. But if you look back to when AMD got back into the server space back in 2017, we actually start off you know, with a lot of demand from the cloud. And it was really around storage and actually object storage. And in fact, a good percentage of the world's public cloud object store goes through AMD Silicon. In fact, probably the vast majority. Um, and it's because the design itself brought uh, the, the elements that you need, um, very high throughput compute. It had uh, a lot of, lot of really good I.O. for both for the network side and then also for the drive side. So that gave it uh, a significant um, advantage in, in uh, you know, being able to bring good TCO, good value, make it scalable, and then make it usable across all of these uh, additional services like file store and block store running on top of uh, object store. Mm. So that was, you know, that the, the performance allows that to happen. And that's, I think, so, something that's fundamentally going to happen also in the enterprise. And this is why I'm super excited with the Cloudian solution. Kumran, you mentioned how you've been supporting object storage in the cloud for years. And what I think is really exciting is now with AMD, Micron, and Cloudian, bringing some of those similar kinds of capabilities and TCOs into the private and hybrid cloud. Recently, Micron released our 6500 SSD, which is a 30 terabyte drive. 
when you combine that with all of the new CPU core power that you can put into a single server, you combine that with the, you know, very large amounts of I.O. that you're driving from Epic. I think that a lot more can be done in a single system than ever before. Mike, what do you, what do you deliver with all of this new capability into an appliance? Yeah, it's really exciting for us because um, in the enterprise, what we see is actually a mixture of workloads, right? So, so you have people doing, you know, the traditional, you know, archival stuff, people doing ransomware protection, people doing more sort of data analytics. And what's interesting about these is that the optimal solution for each one requires a sort of a different ratio of CPU cores to your storage to the amount of I/O. Um, and what we see in this you know, strategic partnership is that starting at the very foundation is you know, Micron's providing the highest performance, the, the, the most dense, um, you know, reliable storage media. That, that's the foundation of everything, right? And on top of that, but in order to bring out the power of that, you need to have AMD's you know, Epic CPUs that um, really gives us a selection of how many cores can we pair with in a single socket to the amount of I.O. that we have, so depending on the workload, you, you can get the optimal amount of hardware. And the challenge for us and something that we spend a lot of time on is how to build a single software suite that can run according to the hardware resources that's available to us. Right? So we, we, we can adapt and adjust and bring out the best of the hardware platform. And you know, together we can deliver solutions that really give you the best cost performance no matter what use case you're, you're using. As you can imagine, right? somebody who's doing long-term archive, compliance, the hardware that they need, the resources they need is very different from someone that's running you know, AI ML or running data lake housing. Sure. Yeah. So, so having that kind of a flexible architecture and the underlying hardware that allows us to have this like socket to core to IO you know, ratio is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And Kumaran, what are you seeing in customer trends in this area. No, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Mike's right on. Um, so one of the th trends that we've seen is, you know, our architecture, we have a central I.O. die, and then the ability to add different numbers and different capabilities in the actual compute dies. You know, we, we, we build essentially a, a server chip with a, 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 a package uh, type architecture that brings together these various chiplets, and that's one of the things that AMD has brought uh, in this generation of, of technology. W but one of the things we've seen uh, is that uh, customers are optimizing, they're picking different types of cores and different numbers of cores with the same, I same rich I.O. set. So you have the same memory interfaces, the same capability in terms of network and, and storage. But just to like Mike's point, what you're able to do is then you have folks that are optimizing for latency. So they'll run those cores as absolutely fast as possible so that you, know, you go from the object to the media you know, as quickly as possible and you're able to, to perform, do those high, high performance applications. You're also able to, to have uh, other servers that are optimized for you know the you know broad set of having large data sets, maybe not quite as much uh, performance in terms of latency, but having you know more IOs and more processing and, and being able to have a greater throughput into the system. Both depend on you know SSD technology from Micron because it gives you the either the throughput or the latency, and you know the, both are are incredibly good. And then the the, the software stack is, is super important because you have to really optimize how you do that name uh, namespace translation into the physical media and as fast as you can do that, that is going to make a solution that scales across many different workloads. And that's really the key for, uh, for Object Store and driving that into the heart of enterprise, in my view. You know, it's so interesting because we do see this kind of virtuous cycle, almost. AMD does a great job of bringing out more cores, more I.O. Um, that allows software like Cloudian's Hyperstore to enhance the capabilities and features that they offer to customers and also then drives us to build larger capacity, more powerful SSDs, which then feeds back into, hey, we're out of compute power, please build us more. What do you see in terms of future trends uh, along object storage, along these more powerful appliances inside the data so, center. So uh, from an AMD standpoint, absolutely. We see this you know, going um, generation to generation, just more 
more storage. Uh, you know, the one really interesting comment from a, a health insurer I got uh, a few weeks back was uh, that you know macroeconomic conditions be damned, the amount of data that they actually need to store is going up two, three, four x a year. Right, and so you know the, the the patients aren't stopping seeing their doctors, and the amount of data that they need to capture continues to grow. Mm. Right, the resolutions of their um, you know whatever the medical imaging, the the number of data points they need to collect and store and analyze, um, and you know in anticipation of using AI for some of these applications, they need to kind of build in and start to collect a fair amount of data, make it performant too. Like you have to be able to get that data quickly. So this is all, uh, you know, I think driving a larger trend towards just having, you know, I, I think the the great benefits that, that Micron bring, those are going to get consumed, you know, generation after generation. So I, I, I do see that uh, the the future is, uh, is just more and more data and having uh, the ability to efficiently uh, uh, access it is, is going to become critical and important. And Mike, you see similar trends and technologies that you're bringing to market to address them? Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, what we're seeing is um, that people are continually asking for higher performance, uh, lower cost, um, more reliable, lower touch, right? So one point I really want to bring out is I think the solutions that we're providing together really provides the best uh, total cost ownership uh, out there. So when people look at just the cost per bit, right? It's easy to say, well, you know, HDDs are cheaper by, you know, several factors and so on and so forth. It's going to stay that way. But actually, if you look at a running system, um, you, you, you're looking at um, how frequently do your devices fail, so how often do you need hands to go and replace failed fail devices. Um, and how much of your, your computer cycles are being spent rebuilding data that, that now has got, got to be re rehydrated in, in, in some fashion. So having reliable media and having uh, media that uses um, less power overall over the lifetime of the data, all that really adds up. So when you know we're seeing out there, just like everyone's saying, like data, uh, people growing the data storage by two to three times every year. They're not getting two to three times the amount of revenue, uh, amount of budget to to store the data. So so that means that there needs to be efficiencies coming out every single year, right? So they're looking for better, faster, cheaper. Um, and you know this is where it's been tremendously important for for, for us. The, the assumption that we made as a company when we started was that you know we were not going to tweak for any particular uh, type of um, like HDD or that that type of media. But what we're going to do is build software that can scale and adapt according to the hardware that we have available to us so that as the hardware sort of innovation continues um, every year uh, at a great pace, our software should be able to bring those benefits to the end user without massive amounts of tuning. It should just work, mm -hmm. right? It should just be better. It should just be faster. And that's very much been the experience that we, we have seen so far, right? Now, in the long term, what I see is that storage is going to bring um, more I.O. and more CPU power with it, meaning um, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to move data around. Moving large amounts of data around costs a lot of money, which is why you know people now have all kinds of solutions, right, all the way up to like you know semi traders to move data around. It's it's, it's expensive. That's why people yeah. say data has gravity, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's very it's 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 not a matter of drawing a line on a chart and say, oh, okay, so the data now is going to move move from here to here. The actual bits take a lot of work and a lot of energy to to move. So what we see is over time, more and more. Um, Compute is going to be actually uh, absorbed into the data storage. Think of your your data storage node to become a, a software-defined compute and storage node, so that the data can be processed more or less in in place, right? Um, and we're seeing some of that already, right? Like we we for us for ourselves, we, we have added search capability into our our system. So that means every every node in a storage um, cluster is now indexing and is now you know searching for things, right? And, and that's how you make it scalable, right? And, uh, and over time, people's going to be want to be doing other kind of, um, you know, data sorting, you know, data filtering, all to try to minimize how much data do you need to move across a network. Because mm -hmm. when you start doing that, it gets expensive. Um, so I think that whole path, the whole trend of having higher density storage, higher performance, higher I.O., coupled with more CPU, or making 
the, the storage nodes smarter and smarter. That is a trend that, that is not, not going to stop uh, for a long, long time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned TCO, and TCO is something we hear about all the time from our customers. It's like such a big focus for data center architects. They have so much to think about. Public cloud, private cloud, SSD, HDD, how many processors, how many racks, how am I going to cool this thing, where am I going to get the power? What are you doing to address the TCO equation for architects? What should they be thinking about when it comes to object store? Yeah, so what we do is we, we provide a software platform that makes it very easy and flexible for people to choose what's the right type of hardware and where to deploy it to, so that they can you know, minimize the cost and minimize energy and so on. We do this in sort of three, three ways, right? One is we're really focused on simplicity and scalability, right? How to do scale at you know, simply, and that means um, we have a, a uniform set of APIs um, that's cloud compatible. We have um, the, the same software that runs on all the nodes uh, in you know, any systems. It's very easy to, to scale, very easy to manage. And I think the easy to manage is key because a big part of it is, is human cost, right? Uh, and so, and that's also where um, you know, reliable hardware um, actually really co comes in because even though our software can tolerate a lot of hardware failure, still somebody's got to go and you know, replace a device. So the less devices they need to replace, you know, the better. And this is where you know, SSD ha has a big advantage over you know, mechanical devices like spinning drives. So that, that's number one, like scale and simplicity, right? Number two is really security, right? Because at the end of the day, that any incident is going to cost the company a ton of money, right? So how do you make sure your data is self-protecting? Uh, so a large part of what we've done is encryption and other kind of access control and other kind of um, um, internal technology to make sure that the data cannot be modified if it's been stated that it cannot be modified. Uh, so we are actually the object storage that we're very proud of that, that we are the most uh, security certified object storage on, on the market. We have the most different kind of certifications and our solutions used by a lot of governments, you know, militaries around the world, um, financial firms, people that need a lot of security. Um, so that is a, a big part of, again, making it simple and ma making it um, a non-event in terms of, you know, ransomware and costs, all that kind of issue. Uh, and then um, finally, it's um, really about um, delivering a solution that gives customers you know, flexibility in terms of, you mentioned public, hybrid, private, clouds. And clouds really here, here, here to stay, right? And people want everything to be done for them as a service, um, but they also don't want to be like, um, you know, beholden to one particular solution. So having our system that's compatible to everything and, and we automatically can move data in and out of um, private, you know, public and hybrid clouds, that really give them the ability of having a single namespace that, that, mm -hmm. that the data can span across all all clouds and data centers, and the same workload, the same code that can run sort of everywhere. And that really is the whole idea of like having your compute follow the data. So the, the three pieces together, like your simplicity at scale, and then your security, uh, and then your ability to be compatible with, with the cloud is really the, the key ways of reducing the total cost of ownership of not only storing the data, but managing and using that data. Yes. That's, that's a really good point, Mike. Like one of the things that um, I've seen in some of the interactions that we've had with uh, leading IT managers and IT decision makers, we've seen um, you know, aspects where they've come to us and told us that their decision making from a TCO point of view is no longer just at the hardware CapEx level. They're actually taking it you know, fairly high up and saying, look, what does it cost me in terms of transactions? Right, like how much? How much is this database? How much is it costing my user? So at that point, you know, using for example SSDs over HDDs, that become SSDs become a win because you're able to deliver so many more transactions. So that combined with Cloudian software and our um, CPUs and the low latency technology we have uh, enables a really big, significant win for, uh, for example, in this case, it was a bank, right? And they're able to have, you know, be able to process that many more transactions, do uh, their overnight jobs, uh, you know, that much more efficiently. And so it was, it was interesting. It was, I think there's, uh, you know, a, a, a new degree of understanding and enlightenment in terms of what they actually need to do and what costs truly mean for them. And you, you mentioned the bank usage case, and you mentioned security. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I can add to that, right? We we have multiple customers that are like tens of petabytes um, of all, all flash uh, geo distributed across multiple countries running as a single cluster um, that um, that are banks, uh, f you know, other financials, PE firms, uh, and, and also um, 
governments, you know, militaries and, and other intelligence agencies. Um, so it, it is, um, you know, a few year, years ago, um, most of those kinds of large scale deployments are spinning drives, right? People are using flash for smaller, like they call hotter data. What we're seeing now is that because of the total cost of ownership has, has come down and they, they can, um, once they kind of expand, like one, one example I have is I have a bank where they started with a spinning drive cluster and an all flash cluster and they have them both kind of span across four different countries, so the bank is in four, four countries. Um, and we've been with them for a couple years now and they've expanded probably six or seven times during that time and every expansion has been on the all flash cluster, right? right. It's been right. every single time because what, what happens is that internally their, their developers can choose which system to use and they, they like the faster one, right? They like the one that's easier mm -hmm. for them. So yeah, so it's, it's really interesting what we yeah, see. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, once they get that feel of the SSD and what it can do in their environment or their applications, it's really hard to go back. I don't know very many people who are going to be booting their PCs off their hard drives anymore. And I think that's certainly the future of data center storage as well. Uh, to get back to that security topic, uh, every day we read about in the news, hackers, ransomware, attacks by bad actors. Uh, Micron's been extremely focused on a daily basis to ensure the security of our products. So we have FIPS-based products, uh, where FIPS is a cer security certification by the US government, uh, which ensures that the way that you implement security in your products is at the highest level to ensure uh, the greatest degree of protection from bad actors. We also have what's called TAA, uh, which is a designation, again by the U.S. government, on where products can be assembled and manufactured to ensure security through the supply chain. And we offer secure encrypting capabilities that are compatible with TCG standards and specifications. In fact, uh, Micron has a website dedicated to product security, uh, micron.com security center. So I invite all of the watchers who are interested in security to check out those capabilities. Kumaran, yeah. one thing that I mentioned very briefly to you, but I, I never gave you, you know, all the details was, I actually started my career at AMD out of college. And yeah, that's it, awesome. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great experience for me, so thank you to AMD for hiring me and giving me my first chance in the world. Um, I guess my mom would be offended, but <laughs> mom, I love you. Uh, uh, but AMD gave me my first professional shot. And when I was at AMD, we launched the Opteron processor. And for those who want a little history lesson, it was the first processor that was 64-bit capable and backwards compatible for all of the 32-bit software that was running. So at the time, AMD saw a huge uptick in market share and demand as this was an industry le leading product. Unfortunately, uh, when I was there, we weren't able to sustain that success into multiple generations. Fast forward 15 years and um, you have released your fourth generation Epic processor. And I think what I see is so impressive is AMD's execution. Earlier you said four generations in five years. You talked about the brave decisions that you had to make to move to the chiplet architecture to allow the rapid innovation as well as the leapfrog of yes. technical capability. What now in this fourth generation Epic processor are data center customers appreciative uh, that is kind of a unique capability or really pushing the boundaries of what the data center needs. So this is great. Uh, Jeremy, it's just awesome that you, were, <laughs> you started your career at AMD. That is fantastic. Um, so when you think about where AMD has come, right? So back in the days of Opteron, our biggest innovation, what really got AMD driven to the market, and if you read, I'm sure there's books written about this, but it was <laughs> inventing the 64-bit ISA for x86. 
which by the way, today in AMD or an Intel processor both use that AMD ISA. In fact, it used to be called AMD 64 for a long time in, in the assembly and in, in like your, uh, your C program, your uh, compilers, right? So um, it, was, uh, it was entrenched and that's what really got AMD back. I would say what, what innovation that is equivalent to the 64-bit ISA today for us is the embrace of chiplets and is that notion that you're able to break out the IO die and the compute die match kind of what the fabs could at the leading edge technology um, can actually um, fab out. Uh, and so you had dies that are not, not too big and you put them all together in a, in a package and you're able to get that level of density and performance and be able to tune it to the different levels that we, uh, that we need and uh, that customers want and, and need for wow. these different applications. Wow. Um, so that's, that's been super, super, powerful and, and, uh, and, and a great um, uh, kind of capability that AMD has mastered early on. Of course, we're driving at the next level. We're looking at 3D packaging technology and all sorts of other capabilities to keep, keep there. Uh, the fundamental though, the formula for AMD success, as you say, it's execution. Uh, since Lisa, Sue, Joined uh, as you know, as our, uh, joined back AMD like 10 plus years ago, and has been our, our CEO now for uh, since since the beginning of the uh, the Zen product line. We have uh, executed consistently uh, and put out the processor on the latest node. Um, you know, within a quarter of when we uh, said we we're going to, and that's been uh, you know a, a fantastic uh, you know value proposition for our customers to leverage uh, low power, high performance. Uh, the best TCO. So all of those factors uh, come in. Mike, how does Cloudian integrate AMD Epic processors and Micron SSDs into your solutions? What is the product? Yeah, so we will have a, a family of appliances and uh, the appliances will be the most um, highly performing, the, mo the most rugged, and um, the best um, total cost of ownership um, storage systems that will be uh, out there. Uh, just to give an example, I mean, we really appreciate the fact that um, you know AMD, you know, Epic Gen 4 is the only processor out there that can handle 128 um, PCIe lanes and up to 128 cores, right, all scaled separately um, on on a single socket. That that's amazing, right? And then having that sit on top of the um, Micron's, um, you know, 30 terabyte, two and a half inch, you know, the, the, the most reliable, the, the highest performing um, flash, um, that's being able to, uh, we, we, we've been doing system testing and we've been able to, to see um, systems that are at least twice as dense as what, what we had before in the same, same rack unit system, twice as dense, but performing two to three times better um, than um, similar uh, all flash-based systems you know, before. So that's really a gigantic leap forward in terms of, uh, you know, 128 yeah, cores and 128 I.O. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, one of the great things about our architecture, again, because of the I.O. die, the I.O.s are separate on a separate die than the, the CPUs, we're able to scale it independently, as, as uh, Mike mentioned. And um, a whole product line has 128 down from 16 cores all the way up to the 128. We all ha we, they all have uh, 128 PCIe lanes. So that, that allows you to take, you know, different uh, design points, uh, different, you know, if you need more namespace, you have larger deployments, you can uh, take advantage of more cores, or if you want, you know, lower number of C CPUs, but higher performance, that's also possible. Have the networking guys been slacking off a little bit? Because, <laughs> you know, I look at all this IO, and I look at what we've been doing in storage, moving to faster SSDs. We have so much SSD capacity and performance in a single array with all this IO. It's incredible, but hard maybe for the network to keep up. So some of this innovation is actually allowing more compute to happen close to the storage, right? What, what do you see in those kinds yeah, of that, trends? That's, yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, you, you know, other innovations happening like, you, you know, GPU Direct and all those things. I mean, they're all meant to kind of feed um, the hungry in the processors, like, you know, so quickly, right? Um, but yeah, in reality, long term, it's really, you, you're going against physics, right? Because to, to move large amounts of, 
information data across um, any distance, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a function of physics. It's more energy, it's more effort, right? So long term, where, where we, we see this going is that the compute and cloud, everything's going to be more and more distributed. So that, that means you want to process as much as you can as close to the data as possible. Again, that, that's where the ability to um, have you know, flexible core count on, in your storage appliance is really critical. You know, and and that, that's the architecture that we built for is that you know, it's a purely software-defined system that allows you to not only manage your data, but you, you can run other tasks on your storage node um, just like you can run on any, any server, right? So that, that's a unique thing that Cloudian has planned for since we started more than 10 years ago and we're starting to see come to fruition now because of wow. that you know, data gravity. And, and more powerful processors, yeah. and more powerful yeah. software, and a, a lot of this is maybe driven by AI. Right. Yes. Right? Absolutely. So what is, what's AMD doing in the AI so space? We have a lot going on in AI. We have a full portfolio of products, including our GPU products, and um, you know, through our uh, Xilinx acquisitions, we call it ACG, some of, the, some of these Alveo cards that can do AI processing. So we have a full set of solutions there. But really, in, in this context, you know, the, the storage is so vital to um, the, the prospects of AI. The, you know, the idea that you can train these large models, you need the right set of data to train on, right? You can't train it on the internet and expect it to you know, serve your business mm. need appropriately. So we're starting to see a lot of thinking around like, you know, what do we do with this valuable data that we have? How do we make it performant enough and then accessible by enough systems? You know, that's where the namespace, you know, the object store architecture is so powerful. You could have an AI system running there doing training as, as you know, transactions are going on. Very, very powerful. And a lot of this is on unstructured data, It's right? almost all on unstructured. Yeah. Ah, and that's where object store yeah, I mean, Science. it's where where you see like every AI software stack. If you look on it, it ends up in the bottom and and object store based on S3. Like we, yeah. we're at the bottom of every single stack, right? And that that's where again where it's going is you you see that um, enterprises are are not going to allow their you know proprietary know-how and the data out into the public models, right? So you see a lot of AI that, that's been done today and done at scale, a large part of it's now done in private clouds. Um, even a lot of the, the well-known ones that are, that are out there, um, they're done in private clouds because it's actually cheaper that way. Um, mm -hmm. Public cloud is cheaper if you have, you know, you know, traffic is kind of bursty, right? But most of this AI workloads are, they're just running all the time. So something that you're running all the time is actually always cheaper if you have a, a dedicated, right? It does not mean that you still got to own data centers. There's people that can operate data center for you. Mm -hmm. But it's just that you, you, you're just paying a fixed cost of, you know, of your That's system right. as opposed to kind of up and down type of, yeah. Mike, what's next in software-defined storage? So I think AI is becoming the ultimate consumer of data. So that means people who's not hoarding data today will hoard data. So, <laughs> so data will kind of grow out of control. So that, that's number one. I think for software-defined storage, the, the challenge is how to continuously provide uh, self-managing, um, high-performance, scalable storage solutions. So we, we, we can't do that without um, great hardware partners like, like yourselves, because without hardware, software, cannot run anywhere, right? So we need that. Um, but in terms of looking at just the key things that I think people is going to care about, I think data sovereignty and data security will continue to be the top requirements of all enterprise IT. And I think total cost ownership will be a, a huge factor as well. Um, and then I think in terms of trends, what, what we're going to see is, is the cloud is going to truly become sort of distributed. So that, that, that means more and more capability is going to be pushed out to, to the edge. So the idea of hybrid and private is going to really merge, public, hybrid, and private is going to merge into just a single cloud concept. Mm -hmm. uh, so all you have to do is look, look at the examples like we've been doing recently, we made announcements that we are partnering with, um, with, with Amazon in their, uh, in their local zones and in their you know, Amazon outposts, which are Amazon programs where they're literally pushing the Amazon cloud to you know, more edge data centers, so that, that's local zones, that, that's still Amazon data centers, but they're more to the edge. Um, and then um, you know, an outpost is pushing a Amazon rack all the way into the customer's data center. And Cloudians partner with them to provide storage in e each of those, those kind of scenarios. Right? So that's, I believe, there will be more and more of this where the, the line between public and private cloud is going to be sort of blurred. Um, so. 
Kumran, anything you want to add yeah. on the future of SDS? No, it's interesting listening to Mike. Uh, I mean, he's got a lot of really good points here, but like, I think the bigger picture here, like just looking at it from the top level, it, storage is going to become needed across many different users and applications. So as AI comes on board and you have your normal transaction processing and all the things kind of happening at the same time, you're going to need very high performance hardware. It's no longer this sort of tiering that you had in the past, right? Where you expected backups to be kept for years without being touched because of regulatory reasons or whatever. That data is now active. It's, it's data that has to get used a lot for training, a lot for analytics, um, and a lot of business critical functions going forward. Uh, so that becomes a, a uh, you know really interesting um, inflection point I think for you know adoption of high performance technologies like like SSDs. In, in so what what business leader says? Let's take a snapshot of my data and then do analytics to make decisions, and I won't have anything recent in my decision making process. Yeah. Every business leader, everyone wants real time data and real time decisions. So in order to be able to transact and analyze on a single database. Uh, requires a lot more performance. That's right. So, I want to thank you both for coming in today as we wrap up. I think one huge takeaway for me personally is just how much all of what we're doing builds on itself. You know, as you deliver more performance and Mike takes advantage, then we have to deliver more capacity and performance in our drives and put that pressure back on you. <laughs> so. It's a, that virtuous circle, cycle. <laughs> the virtuous cycle, yeah, I think that's what's going to really delight customers. And I just want to thank you both for your personal involvement and your company's partnership as we work together to bring solutions to our customers for their benefit. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for hosting us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. We're excited to be here.